Welcome to the uh, pre-op hip and knee class from Joseph Brand Hospital. Um, thank you for choosing us. And uh, during this presentation, it could get a little lengthy. So at any point, if you need to pause it, get up and stretch, feel free, sit back, relax and enjoy. Okay. Um, a few people will be talking today. I as a nurse, um, pharmacy will talk to you, occupational health and physiotherapy will talk as well. So, we will, oh my goodness. Um, I'm going to talk about um, getting you ready for surgery, your pre-op appointments, your day of surgery, your hospital stay, preventing complications after surgery, and preparing you for your discharge home. Okay, and other people as they talk along will cover some of these things as well. So these packages will be given out to you when you come in to pre-op. Um, we will have envelopes for you with these, this package of information for you. So you'll be able to take it home and read all about your new knee or your new hip. There's a lot of information in there. And uh, if you have any questions, just make sure you're writing them down and bring them in uh, when you come in for your surgery and people can answer them for you. Okay, so this is a picture of a normal knee and it's your cartilage that's uh, missing from most of you now. It's all been worn away and you're just bone on bone. So this will all get replaced and you'll much, feel much better. Your new hip, same sort of thing. It's just a ball and socket. It moves in a few different directions than the knee does. And it actually is not lined completely with cartilage. It's just on the one side there. So that all gets fixed for you. Uh, a lot of hips are more uncomfortable pre-surgery than they are after surgery. So that's just a little plus to keep in mind for people thinking about it. Um, as far as preparing for surgery, what to bring in the hospital the day when you come. So you want to wear nice, comfortable clothing because keep in mind you're wearing these clothing, this clothing home. Uh, you'll have a little bit of swelling on that hip or knee. So something nice and loose. Bring your glasses in if you need them. You do need non-slip walking shoes for when you're getting up with physio. Anybody that's on a CPAP machine to help them breathe at night, that needs to come in for the duration of the stay as well. Your pills don't need to come in with you unless you're on eye drops, puffers, um, those need to come in with you, okay? And anybody renting ice machines that we'll talk about further on down, that will need to come in with you as well. Um, preparing for surgery, so the equipment you need to get. Physio and OT will go into this in more detail, um, but you will have to have your walker, your raised toilet seat at home ready for you. And uh, for people having hips, well, knees too, your shoehorns, and they're going to go over a bunch of other um, uh, equipment that you would like to have for when you get home. You do not need to bring your walkers into the hospital. The walker will be supplied by the hospital while you're here. So here's our ice machine slide. So basically what this ice machine is, it's a, it looks like a, an old fashioned cooler and there's a, a side on it that you put ice in and water to a certain level. And it's attached to tubing wrapped around a sleeve that gets wrapped around your knee or your hip. So it is plugged in and it pumps up this nice ice cooled water around your joint. It minimizes the swelling. It helps with pain control and it does promote healing not a complete necessity, it is optional. Um, a lot of benefits are not covering it, some do. So check, there are, uh, this is the uh, game ready through the surgeon's office, um, but there are other ones out there. Some people do buy them, um, just something for you look, to look into. Um, and the, the other thing with the ice machine too, make sure you've taken it out of the box, have a look at it, familiar, familiarize yourself with it. Um, figure out how to run it so that when you get home, you're not at a loss and that it helps the floor when you come in as well. Understanding your healthcare team. You have your surgeon, you have your anesthetist, you have your nurses, um, whether they're registered nurses, registered practical nurses, PSWs, um, you have physiotherapy, you have occupational therapy, and you have your pharmacist. And everybody works as a team to get you through all this. Who else do you use in, in um, your prep before and after surgery? So uh, anybody that's basically in your life right now, you can use them if you know your spouse, um, your family members, um, 
neighbors, uh, anybody that can help have meals prepped for you. Um, if you need groceries brought into the house, uh, physio appointments after surgery, um, any other errands that you need done. Preparing for surgery, what can you do to prevent infection? So we ask that you do this chloric hexidine soap the night before. And when we talk to you on the phone, we'll give you more information about that. Um, your shower is the night before. You do not shower the morning of. At the end of your shower, you scrub the affected leg with this chlorhexidine according to the instructions that you'll be given as well. Um, you make sure your linen on your bed has been freshly changed. Your clothes that you wear after, um, if pajamas or if you're putting clothes back on and clothes you wear to the hospital the next morning, all need to be freshly laundered as well. Okay, that's the big thing about the prep the night before. And once again, no shower in the morning, the day of surgery. Make sure you're washing your hands often. Uh, you're gonna limit what you're bringing into the hospital. As far as what you're bringing into the hospital, you don't need to bring in a lot. You've got your non-slip shoes. You've got something to pass your time. You've got your toiletries, um, your ice machines or, or your sleep machines, any of that sort of thing. And uh, that's, that's really all you need. You don't need to bring in pajamas or house coats or anything like that. Do not shave your legs prior to surgery for a few days. You don't want to open your legs to open those pores to any uh, irritation from the surgery itself. No nail polish is the, is the other thing, especially on your toes. But they're asking no nail polish on your fingers as well. Um, your pre-surgery appointments. So presently, you're going to get a phone call from a nurse. Um, well, maybe first you're going to get a phone call from a clerk. It'll either be a clerk setting up an appointment with a nurse or the nurse will just be calling you. Um, and you'll just, um, we're gonna do all your medical history with you, have your medications ready. Uh, we put those all in the computer so that everything's organized for when you come in as, a, as an inpatient. Um, we, uh, apart from doing your history over the phone, we can answer any questions you have then as well. Uh, that phone call can take up to an hour, depending how complicated things are. When you come in, you'll be set up to come in for one appointment into the pre-op clinic. You'll have an ECG, your blood work done at that time. You will see an internal medicine doctor as well as an ANISA test. Now, for those not seeing an internal medicine doctor in the clinic, you will be asked to see an internal medicine doctor outside of the hospital. And then when you come in for your appointment, you'll just see the ANISA test. As well on that appointment, you will also get a hip, an X-ray of your knee or hip done as, at the same time. So what to expect the day of surgery? Um, you'll come in, you have to go to admitting first, you check in with admitting and then you head up to the second floor where when you get off the elevator, you register there. You'll take a seat, the nurses will call you in, they're gonna go over all your paperwork, they start your IV, the surgeon comes and talks to you, the anesthetist comes and talks to you. This anesthetist will be the one that's doing your case that day versus the one that sees you in the clinic. So it's not necessarily the same person. When they're ready for you in the operating room, they will bring you to the operating room. The operating room nurse comes over and chats with you as well, I think. Um, so you, you get to meet everybody before your surgery actually starts. Uh, the day of surgery, um, when you see the anesthetist in the clinic, he'll talk to you then about a spinal versus a general, as far as the an anesthesia goes. So a spinal basically is, it is a little bit of freezing in your back with a needle going in. Um, in that, they put some freezing in there as well as a low, uh, some narcotic that helps with pain control for the next 24 hours. It does freeze you from, could be the nipple line waist downward. It does wear off. Everybody does get up and walk after. Um, and the other thing with the spinal is you get some light sedation with it. So we encourage these, it does, help with um, the healing process and you're kind of one step ahead when you wake up without having any discomfort. If you have that general anesthesia, you are put to sleep totally. You have an airway in, you'll have a sore throat after. Um, and when you wake up, you're gonna be very uncomfortable and it will take the, the girls in recovery a little while to get your pain under control. So definitely the better way to go is the spinal. 
And, the, and once again, the anesthetist will talk to you about it when you come into the clinic. Um, your final decision actually is, is the day when you come into surgery. So um, if you have any hesitations, then you can discuss them along the way as well. In recovery room, when your surgery done is done, your surgery is roughly one to two hours. Um, when it's done, you're uh, taken into recovery room. Your blood pressure, you're attached to the heart monitor. Your blood pressure is monitored frequently. Uh, your pain management is is observed through the whole thing. If you're having the spinal, they will do uh, checks to make sure the spinal is wearing down. Um, if you decide on the general, they will uh, manage your pain while you're there. Once you get, once you're clear from recovery, then you will uh, head to your room. Uh, the girls on the floor manage your vital signs as well. Uh, pain management also. You are started on a clear liquid diet. You're given water and popsicles in recovery room and uh, the clear liquid diet is maintained just to uh, make sure that we're not moving you too quickly with that. And then as the nurses feel appropriate, they'll change that for you. You will get your phys uh, physio uh, evaluation. Um, you're up walking, deep breathing and coughing exercises are encouraged. You're encouraged to uh, pump your calves to do your leg exercises as well. Uh, the eight o'clock surgeries, a lot of times physio is actually getting them walking that same day. Okay, the ones later on, maybe not till the morning, but that'll all be decided once you get to the floor. You go home with a prescription. Uh, for pain controls, uh, just make sure that you're drinking lots of water. You want to watch out for constipation from your pain from the narcotics. Um, your physio appointments are all arranged for you before you go home. Uh, follow-up appointment with your surgeons. Um, you drive according to your surgeon's protocol. So there's no driving until you've got the okay from your surgeon, okay? There's no showering as well until you get the okay from your surgeon as far as your activity goes. So you're just sponge bathing at the sink until you get that okay. While you're in the hospital, we expect to uh, have your pain at a controlled rate. Um, we like patients to be less than four out of 10. So if you think of 10 as the worst pain, five kind of halfway and zero is no pain, we expect you to be three to four out of 10. Um, you do want to go on a concoction of medications while you're in here. You get some Tylenol, usually an anti-inflammatory, and there will be a narcotic of some sort, whether it's um, in a pill form, and there's usually some stuff that you can ask for as extra if needed. So preventing the complications after surgery, the constipation I mentioned, make sure you're drinking lots of water, add fiber to your diet, any over-the-counter stool softeners if you need them, okay? Blood clots, make sure you're moving, um, you know, whether they're in your legs or in, um, in your lungs, if you're having a sudden onset of chest pain or something uh, to that effect, then you're just gonna call 911 and get yourself to the hospital in that respect. If you're having discomfort in your legs with a swollen calf or a hot calf or pain in your calf, anything like that, then you need to get that checked out as well. Do your deep breathing coughing exercises and stay moving to prevent any, any pneumonias. You wanna keep those lungs as aired out as you can. Um, you've decluttered your house before you come in. So hopefully there's nothing in the way for you. You don't want to be falling and ruining your new hip that you've just gotten. Uh, have have people available to help you. Make sure your slipwear at home is non-slip as, as well. Use your glasses so that you have the proper judgment when you're uh, moving around. <clears throat> as far as your skin goes, keep moving, watch your incision. So you wanna make sure you get a clean, nice dressing put on your hip incision or your knee incision before you go home. You wanna monitor the area around it while you're at home. Uh, just watching out for any signs of infection. So any redness that starts spreading, um, any discharge coming onto the uh, uh, dressing or through the dressing. And if you have a fever or anything like that, you need to uh, call your surgeon, your family doctor, or can't get a hold of anybody, then bring yourself into eMERGE, get it treated. Um, so we talked about getting your house ready at the beginning for, di uh, for discharge. So you've decluttered, you've removed your mats, your walkers at home, 
your glasses, hearing aids are with you all the time. You've got your non-slip footwear on and you have a call bell for help of some sort or you have family around you. Um, if anybody lives on their own and needs to go into some respite care after or is considering respite care, it is self-pay and it is something that you have to uh, look into on your own, okay? Uh, there is a list provided in the package that you will get. Um, and uh, it, it's not cheap, but it is out there and available for you. And different places have different... Um, uh, length of stays that li they like you to stay there. Some go day by day. Some it's a minimum of two weeks. Some it's a month. So check them out if you need that sort of thing. And the other thing is some do require chest x-rays ahead of time. And that's to make sure that if you are going there, that uh, that is done in advance. So that when you're actually discharged from the hospital, you're all ready to go. Hi, my name is Tamer. I'm one of the pharmacists here at Joseph Brown Hospital. And this portion of the presentation We'll be focusing on medications you're taking after you leave the hospital. One of the biggest themes or topics we're going to be covering is anticoagulants. I'm going to call them blood thinners from now on. It's just a bit easier to remember. We're going to go through very core questions that a lot of patients ask. What is a blood thinner? Why you're going to take a blood thinner? For how long? Uh, common examples you'll hear me talk about is Xeralto and Fragment, and I'll discuss that further later in the presentation. Of course, with any drugs, we'll cover side effects and other important information patients before you have asked, I figure I'd share with you. So let's get started. What is a blood thinner and why I'm gonna be on it? A blood thinner is a medication that's gonna help prevent clots, all right? And why you're gonna be taking blood thinners, especially after surgery, is because once you have surgery, uh, you will not be running a marathon the next day. What will happen is, as you're healing, you're going to be moving a bit slower than you normally would before you had surgery. And as a result, the blood in your body is not moving as fast, and that creates an environment where your blood can clump or create clots. And there's different types of clots that you may hear about. There's good clots and bad clots. Good clots are clots that protect your body. Right, think of it as you fell on your elbows and your knees, you got scraped, and these scabs form after a day or two. These are clots that prevent, prevent excuse me, protect your body from dirt or from you bleeding for the rest of the day. But what we're focusing on are the bad clots, clots that can form in your body, travel to different parts of your body, and create harm. And the ones we usually focus on are the ones you see on the screen. Uh, deep vein thrombosis or claw in your leg, they use the acronym DVT, uh, that usually shows up or presents itself as uh, either your operated leg or your other leg that is swollen, it's red, and it's painful and hot to the touch. Uh, you could have clots that happen in your lungs. As you see on the screen here, we call it a pulmonary embolism or to use the word uh, acronym PE. Since it's in your lungs, it can affect the way you breathe. Uh, you can have clots in your heart, heart attacks, clots in your brain, strokes, and all these types of surgical complications, as we call them, are situations where if they were to happen after surgery, you go to the ER. But this is why we take blood thinners to prevent these complications from happening. Now, one of the biggest questions all of our, my patients ask is, when will I start these blood thinners? A majority of our patients start these blood thinners usually the, more, the next morning after surgery. Now, there'll be a few cases where some patients, if they have surgery earlier in the day, they may start the night of, but for most of our patients, they will start the next morning. Now, for how long will I be taking these blood thinners? It depends on the type of surgery you are doing. For those who are getting knee replacements, you'll be doing it for 14 days. For my hip replacements, because it's a bigger joint and there's bigger muscle groups like your butt and your quad, you'll be doing or taking blood thinners for about 30 days. Now, what are the common uh, blood thinners out there? I'll go through that in the next few slides. What I like to tell most of my patients are there's two separate categories of blood thinners. There's pills that you take by mouth and there's injections. 
And for those who are concerned, a majority of you or 99% of you will be leaving with oral medications. I just want to let all of you know that there is an injection out there in the market. But before we kind of jump into the details of those drugs, I always like to remind patients that you know, surgeons or your physicians that you're seeing will choose your blood thinners and they usually base it off a few factors. One of them is what kind of medications you're on and can they interact with the blood thinner they're going to prescribing? Or you may have certain medical conditions such as liver disease, kidney disease, maybe a history of cancer. In certain cases, certain blood thinners are more suited for patients who have these conditions. But at the end of the day, the physician you see is going to personalize and pick a blood thinner that's appropriate for you. So let's get started on one of the main blood thinners you may see or be prescribed after you have surgery. One of them is called Xeralta. And the way Xeralta works is it prevents clots from happening in your body. And the second point, which is the main point, is it doesn't require any blood work needed. Now, some of you are probably wondering, why is that even relevant? Now, for those of you who may know or heard of Coumadin or Warfarin, that's a very old drug that came out, and it's one of the first blood thinners that came out into the market. Now, it revolutionized the way we treat patients, but it came at a few costs almost. It was um, had a lot of food restrictions, a lot of drug interactions, and the biggest thing was patients who were taking warfarin had to go to a clinic maybe once a week or once every two weeks to get blood drawn out of them. And that wasn't very pleasant for a lot of patients. So these new blood thinners that you hear me talk about will not require these blood monitoring systems. So that's a good thing and hopefully it doesn't cause any problems. Now, the way Zoralto works is you take it once a day. You may take it with or without food. And I know it says you take it each morning. What I like to tell most of my patients is you can take it any time of the day, whether it be lunch or dinner. We just find that every time we tell patients to take it in the morning, they tend to remember first thing in the morning when they wake up to take their medications. But if you find that it's not suitable, you can take it at lunchtime or at dinner time, as long as every 24 hours, that's okay with me. And the last important note is it's important not to miss any doses. The reason I mentioned this on the slide is because we found out once patients go home, they don't have the nice nurses reminding them to take their medications. And what ends up happening is they miss some of their medications and they end up in the ER for those surgical complications I mentioned earlier, whether it's a DVD or P DVT or a PE. And we want to avoid that. So please remember to take your medications. Now let's talk about the economics of things, or is it covered by insurance? But before I get to that, I want to explain what ODB stands for on this slide. It stands for Ontario Drug Benefit Plan. Think of it as OHIP for drugs. It's usually offered or given to pay, uh, people who have Ontario health cards. And if they are over the lovely age of 65 or under the age of 25. So if you meet that category and you are prescribed Zeralto, when you are filling it at the pharmacy, you have some financial assistance from the government. Now, if you don't meet that category, but you have private plans from your spouse or from your work, most private plans do cover it. If you are the few that have to pay out of pocket, it's about $3 per day. So for my knees, it's about $42 for the whole regiment. For my hips, it's about $90. This is really important fact when we start talking about the injection and why we prefer oral medications. And we'll talk about it in the next slide. So fragments are injection and similar to our oral medications, it's just once a day, and there's no blood work that's needed. But of course, with injections, people get very nervous that they have to inject themselves at home. Just know that if you are the rare few that get this prescribed, while you're in the hospital, you'll see myself or another pharmacist come in with a dummy needle and a dummy ball and a kit, and we'll go through how to inject yourself and go through demos together until you build enough confidence to feel that you could do it by yourself. And with the kit that we'll bring in during our time together, there'll be a sharps container, an alcohol swab, and a fragment booklet, which has pictures in case you forget everything I teach you that day. The Sharps container, I just want to quickly touch base on it, is basically the garbage for the needles you are using. So if you are the ones who have fragment taking at home and you use it to inject yourself, 
please throw the needles in these sharps containers. They're not recyclable. And once you are done, whether you're 14 days or 30 day regiment, close that sharps container, take it to any pharmacy and they can dispose it for you safely. Let's talk about the costs of these injections. Right off the bat, you'll notice that ODB does not cover these injections. Most private plans do, but the main thing I want to focus on is how much you might be paying out of pocket. It's about three times as much, which is $10 per day. So for my knees, it's about $140. And for my hip replacements, it's about $300. This kind of emphasizes, as I was saying earlier, why we prefer oral medications. Now, some of you are probably wondering, okay, this is great information, but I'm already on a blood thinner for other reasons. What's gonna happen to me? If you are uh, patients who have, let's say Coumadin or on Perdaxa or Eliquist or whatever blood thinner that may be for certain heart conditions or whatever conditions you are being treated for, just know that big picture, before uh, you have your surgery, you'll be asked to stop these medications. You'll have your surgery, the next day, we'll continue that particular blood thinner and not change anything about it. We continue what specialized our specialists prescribe you, and we won't change anything about that. So if you're nervous about that, please note that we will not be changing anything about this. Now let's talk about side effects. A lot of people want to know about side effects. With blood thinners, since it's thinning out your blood, you know, cuts like from paper cuts or you might bruise a bit more easily, that can happen. And they're usually very minor and they stop eventually. With the injections, you may bruise a bit easier when you inject yourself. Again, something that resolve over time. But the main thing I want us to focus on are side effects that become dangerous or bleeding events, as I call them, okay? And in this slide are a few points where I'm gonna go through each one, but essentially, if they happen to you, although they're very rare events, if they do happen to you, you're gonna do two things. One, stop the medication. Two, go to the ER, all right? And again, I can't stress this enough. It's very rare situations, but we'll go through each point and explain what I mean by them. So as I mentioned, blood thinners can cause bleeding, but if this bleeding happens longer than 10 minutes and doesn't stop, that's usually a big indication that says, hey, this blood thinner is too strong for me. And the most common areas people notice these things are your nose, your gums, and whatever happens in the bathroom. So your urine could be red or your stools are red or black. Those are triggers or cues that should remind you, hey, this is not normal. There's something wrong, okay? Uh, you'll see in point three, bleeding from the surgical site. I like to explain this as after you have your surgery, you usually have some sort of band-aid or dressing as they call it. Think of it as a clear tape that has a little white foam in the middle and they usually cover the areas where they uh, cut you to replace your joints. Now that's usually supposed to be clean and not red. So if you wake up one morning or you notice after uh, the morning or, or night that your dressing is red, that's not supposed to happen. That means you're bleeding from where they uh, had the surgery on. Or a second point where you see here unexplained bruising, I like to call this the internal bleeding scenario, okay? Think of it as you wake up one morning, you have a purple rash that's on your skin. It's not itchy, but it keeps spreading as day goes. Again, very rare situations, but if any of these points that I just mentioned ever happen, it's really important to seek medical attention as soon as possible and stop the medication. This slide, I'd like to give an example of what your prescription will look like when you leave the hospital. Usually it's just a piece of paper that has a blood thinner and pain medications. Uh, usually for the pain medications, the most common ones I see being prescribed are Tylenol 3 or Percocets. For those of you who may have taken this before or may have allergies to these medications, please let the team know there are other alternatives out there. I just like to show you what kind of uh, prescription you'll be getting once you leave the hospital. Now, of course, you're going to take this prescription to your local pharmacy. And the one thing I always like to tell people is, especially after you have surgery, if there's any new medications or new over-the-counters or 
vitamins or herbals you're going to you know, try after your surgery, just make sure to ask your pharmacist before taking them because certain medications can interact with your blood thinner. In the next few slides, I'm going to go through common over-the-counters and vitamins that people should avoid temporarily while they're on blood thinners. So let's get started. First slide's about common over-the-counter stuff. Aspirin, Advil, Aleve, Motrin. Some of you have heard these things and may be using these things. For the time being, unless it's told or directed by your surgeon to take it, I would recommend to avoid these products temporarily while you're on blood thinners, whether it be 14 days or 30 days. These medications can interact with, with blood thinners and sometimes cause those bleeding events that I just mentioned earlier. So once again, if your surgeon says it's okay, that's fine. But until then, or if not, please avoid these medications. Now, some of you are probably wondering, okay, what if I had a headache? What if I have muscle spasm that has nothing to do with my surgery? What do I take? I don't wanna just wait here until my headache resolves. Tylenol is usually our safe alternative that you can take. Uh, for those who are not interested in taking more pills, you can use creams. Uh, the most common ones I would suggest are Tiger Balm or Rub A35A or Arnica gels. That's a couple examples you can use in case you wanna use them to help uh, relieve muscle pain or spasms. And this slide are the most common vitamins and herbals I see, uh, but also please feel free to ask the pharmacist would be myself during your stay here, or even the ones you see or trust, but other herbals that you may be taking and whether or not they interact. But for those ones that I'm listing on my screen, like vitamin E, uh, fish oil, garlic supplements, uh, glucosamine for my arthritis patients listening to me today, please avoid them temporarily. These medications, if you take them with blood thinners, can create those bleeding events uh, that we want to avoid, okay? Uh, for those of you who are taking calcium or vitamin D like David, a B or B complexes like Bob or magnesium, those are safe to take while you're taking blood thinners. But for those on the screen that you see, please avoid them temporarily while you're on blood thinners. Let's talk about my favorite slide. Can I drink alcohol? Now the answer is a bit different from the slides before. It's to drink in moderation. So yes, you can, just no more than one drink per day. And a drink by definition is anything from 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, one ounce of whiskey. So if you're wondering, can I drink alcohol? The answer is yes, but in moderation. Now, what else should I know? Some patients ask, okay, what if I forget to take my dose? What I like to tell patients is, take it as soon as you remember on the same day. Please do not double up uh, because that could increase your risk of a bleeding event. So the main message I tell people is take it as soon as you remember and don't double up. Other things I like to tell my patients is, let other healthcare professionals know that you had a hip replacement or knee replacement and that you are taking blood thinners. The reason why sometimes certain professionals may have different plans uh, for you if that's the case. An example I like to tell patients are dentists. Some dentists, after you have a joint replacement, may require you to take antibiotics for general cleanings, maybe a day before, for a couple of years, or uh, a couple or for the rest of your life, depending on how the dentist practice. But the main message I want to leave you with is let other professionals know if you're seeing specialists after your surgery that you're taking blood thinners and you had a new joint replaced. Mets checks. For those who do know what Mets checks is, think of it as a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a pharmacist. Uh, usually I recommend this to all my patients who are taking three or more medications and it serves uh, as a important thing for patients to do a couple things. One is to learn about the medications. Two, it gives a chance for the pharmacist to see what medications you may not need. But thirdly, which is the most important thing for us at Joseph Brown Hospital is they give you an updated medication list. The reason why this is important is because your stay here is gonna be very short and we want your uh, transition in and out of the hospital very smoothly. And a big part of that is making sure we have 
an up-to-date med list so we can continue those medications while you stay at Joseph Brandt Hospital. Now, for those of you who are not interested or don't think this is something that's important for you, you can always call your pharmacy and ask them for a med list that you're taking. And I usually suggest patients to bring that in or give it to the pre-op nurse uh, if they call you or tell them about it while they call you. I like to usually do a summary. It's usually a quiz format, but we're gonna kind of skip this a bit. But I just like to tell patients that, again, there's different types of blood thinners out there. Some of them are covered, like the tablet Zeralto. The cost, if you pay out of pocket, it's about $3 to $10 a day. And of course, always remember that for those who are taking or doing a knee replacement, it's about 14 days you're taking blood thinners. And from a hip replacement, it's about 30 days. And before I wrap this up, I always want to remind patients, always ask your pharmacist if you're starting new medications and always inform the healthcare professionals that you're seeing after in case they need to change their treatment plan for you. And the last bit I'll say is for those who are coming, please remember to bring the small items, which are creams, inhalers, and eye drops. And the reason why I ask patients to bring these medications is because in this hospital, Joseph Brandt, we carry a lot of medications. Uh, unfortunately, we don't carry all of them. And we found that with inhalers and eye drops, since there are a lot of new ones coming out into the market, please bring those so we don't have any hiccups during your stay. And for those who are taking rare medications for, let's say, multiple sclerosis, uh, oral chemotherapy medications, or you suffer from something called pulmonary fibrosis, or any rare genetic conditions, if you're on treatment for those, please bring them. We carry a lot of variety of medications for those patients. Fortunately, maybe not all of them. We don't have any hiccups during your stay here. Thank you so much for listening to me. My name is Tamer, I'm one of the pharmacists here. Have a great day. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Nicole. I'm from Occupational Therapy. I'll be speaking to you about what you can expect from a therapy perspective during your stay at the hospital. Uh, so myself, I'll be going over uh, sort of the care plan or what you can expect during your stay. If you're having a hip replacement, then I'll be going over some movement restrictions or hip precautions. Um, and I'll also be talking to you about um, how to get uh, dressed and toileting and different devices that you can use. Uh, briefly review what transfers might look like and talk about some equipment. And then Megan from Physiotherapy will speak to you a little bit about um, mobility and walking and also how to prepare your home as well as what equipment you might need when you go home. So as you can see here, um, a typical sort of length of stay or what it typically looks like is you'll come into the hospital and you'll have your surgery. We call uh, that day zero. Um, you, when you come back up to the floor after your surgery, it's possible that you'll be given some exercises to do and you may even get up and go for a walk. Um, the next day you'll have some more therapy. So you'll either see my, you'll see myself if you're having a hip replacement. Um, and you'll see a physiotherapist to take you for another walk. If you have stairs to do at home, you'll do the stairs um, and then you'll go home. So it is a short stay, but it really is all the time that you need to sort of get on your feet and get out the door. Um, and a majority of your recovery will happen at home. So one thing we like to make clear is that there's no sort of further rehab or anything that happens at the hospital. Um, you will have your further sort of physiotherapy um, at home. So as I mentioned, if you are having a hip replacement, there are a few movement restrictions or what we call hip precautions. So there's three rules. Um, if you're having a knee replacement, then you don't really need to attend to these slides. You don't have any movement restrictions. So these are just for those of you having a hip replacement. So the first one is no bending at the waist past 90 degrees. Uh, so as you can see in the pictures, it also means no bringing your knee up past your waist. So one way to think of it is that your um, hips should always be sitting or um, higher than your knees. Uh, so for things like getting dressed, like putting on your pants, your socks, your underwear, um, you would have to typically bend down or bring your leg up. So I will be um, teaching you while you're in hospital how to do these activities um, in light of your hip precautions. The other movement you're um, not supposed to do is no crossing your legs. So no crossing at the feet or crossing at the ankles. 
Um, so sometimes people will put a pillow in between their legs if they are somebody who does that unconsciously. Um, so that's a strategy at home. And the third is no twisting. So I always say you kind of have to move like a log uh, and your nose and your toes should be pointing in the same direction when you're moving or turning. Um, but all of these PIP precautions we will review with you while you're in hospital as well. Uh, so we'll remind you and educate you, but it's just to give you a bit of a heads up. Um, in terms of positioning after a hip replacement, um, because you know we don't want you to be bending at the waist past 90 degrees, it's important that you're sitting on surfaces where you're um, high enough. So one thing I like to say is look at the chair you sit on at home and your hips should be at least level with your knees or higher. If you're sitting on a chair and your knees are raised higher than your hips, it's probably too low. So um, things you can do to elevate that is to sit on a pillow or a cushion or get furniture risers, um, things that can go underneath the legs of your chair or couches. Um, this is also um, a pretty popular item if you're having a hip replacement. It's a, a foam wedge. So some people will get something like this uh, for the car so that if they're sitting and they put their seat in the car, their hips are positioned higher than their knees. You don't need to get something like this. It's just um, been found to be helpful. This slide about recliner chairs, um, the, the general consensus is not to sit in recliner chairs. And I think to some degree, that's because they're very difficult to get out of and they often require you to kind of bend yourself and lend yourself forward. Um, if you have a recliner chair at home and you really would like to sit on it, talk to one of the therapists during your stay um, and we'll help problem solve or strategize if there is a safe way to get out of the recliner chair. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of sleeping or resting, um, if you're someone who likes to sleep um, on your side, that's fine. If you can tolerate it, just put a pillow in between your legs to prevent crossing or twisting while you're sleeping. Um, so this slide, usually I would show you how to transfer out of the chair with the walker, but for the sake of the presentation, I'll just explain the most important takeaway is that when you're standing up from a chair, you're never pulling on the walker to stand. Um, the walker is not very stable um, in terms of getting up, so it would just come back with you. So we always recommend pushing off of the armrest. You'll have lots of practice doing that during your stay, so um, don't worry too much about it. Um, in terms of other equipment, so as I mentioned, um, if you're having a hip replacement, it you won't be able to bend down to put on your socks, your shoes, your pants, so there are some assistive devices out there that can help you do those things. Um, so the first one is in the picture is a sock aid or a sock device. Um, the other helpful devices are a long handled reacher. So it's kind of like that long stick with a grabber at the end of it. Um, and that can be used to help you put on your pants or your underwear, as well as to pick things up off the ground if you drop them at home. Um, a long handled shoehorn is very helpful. Um, and then sometimes people like elastic shoelaces, so they don't have to worry about tying their shoes. Um, so all of these devices you can purchase um, at any sort of home health store. Um, we do uh, recommend that if you're having a hip replacement, you at least get some of these um, because the goal is that you're able to do things for yourself. If you're having a knee replacement, you don't need any of this equipment. However, if you'd like to be independent or you think it might be helpful, um, then you can also get that equipment. Um, I will be showing you how to use this equipment if you're having your hip replacement. So I can teach you how to use all the devices. There's lots of videos out there as well, but don't stress too much. Just get the devices and I'll show you how to do the, how to use them while you're here. Um, other equipment that you'll need to rent after surgery is a two-wheeled walker um, and a commode or a raised toilet seat. If you have stairs to do, you'll also need to purchase a cane. So in terms of the toilet seat or the commode or raised toilet seat, as you can see, um, there's two pictures here. Um, the first one is a commode and the second is a raised toilet seat with arms. They both serve the same function, which is to elevate the toilet seat so you're not sitting on a super low toilet. Um, and they also have armrests. So you'll find um, after your surgery, you may rely on armrests to kind of help you push up and help you sit down. Um, so either one would be fine. 
um, just keep in mind the space and the layout of your bathroom to see what you think would be um, the most appropriate. Um, but definitely if you're having a hip replacement, you need something that adds height. So it has to be either the commode or a raised toilet seat with arms. Um, the other note is about bathing. So you aren't allowed to shower until your staples are removed. Uh, so that's about two weeks. So you'll have to sponge bathe for that time. Um, again, just keep in mind, if you're having a hip replacement, you can't bend down to your feet or below your knees. So there are things like long handled sponges out there. Um, there's long handled alufas and bath sticks. Anything like that will be fine um, just for those two weeks to help you reach all those other, other places that you can't bend to. Uh, in terms of getting in and out of a car, um, so the, it doesn't really matter what kind of car you go home in. Um, obviously it's better if you can get into like a medium sized car rather than a big um, pickup truck. That being said, people are still able to get in and out. So um, the important thing is that uh, when you get into the car seat, you're going um, sort of perpendicular to the direction of the car, as you can see in the picture. Uh, so you're kind of gonna go bottom first, and then you're gonna swing your legs into the seat or whoever's driving you will help you swing your legs. Some tips to make it a bit easier are to recline the seat or push the seat um, further back to give you more space. And if you throw a garbage bag or a plastic bag on the seat, that will also help you twist um, and or not twist, slide a little bit easier. In terms of driving after surgery, your surgeon needs to clear you for driving. Um, the length of time varies from person to person and depends on a, a bunch of different things. So you'll ultimately just have to wait till you hear the go ahead from your surgeon. Um, so in terms of groceries, getting out, getting to appointments, just um, anticipate that you probably won't be driving for four to six weeks um, and make appropriate arrangements with family or friends to help you get around. If you need like a parking pass or an accessible parking permit, that's something that we can help you with while you're here. Just let someone on the team, either your nurse or your therapist know and we can help fill that out for you. So ultimately what to bring to hospital uh, when you come for either your hip or your knee replacement, um, we do recommend bringing your dressing aids or your dressing devices uh, so that you can practice with what you have. Uh, we also recommend you bringing loose fitting, comfortable clothing. So usually just stuff with an elastic waistband. Um, if you wanna bring socks, um, I know right now it's summer, so you might not bring socks, um, but if you are bringing them, just make sure they're um, pretty loose and easy to get on and off. And then obviously in supportive footwear. So something with, um, uh, like a rubber sole and ankle support is preferable. You can bring your patient education book or whatever information you've received if you want to bring that with you. Um, you don't need to bring your walker or your commode. Uh, we have those in hospital, um, but you will need to make sure you have that equipment before you leave the hospital. So make sure you have the walker and the commode waiting for you. Um, so we usually say get it before surgery. All right, that's it for me. Up next is Megan from Physiotherapy. All right, so hi everyone. My name's Megan. I'm one of the physiotherapists uh, who work on the surgical floor. Um, so you might work with myself or one of my colleagues. Um, I'm just gonna go over the care plan once more. I know you've seen this slide, but I'll go over it again. You're gonna come in for your surgery, the day of your surgery, depending what time your surgery was. Um, you may make it up to the floor in order to see physio on the day of. Um, don't worry if not, but if you're there, then we may come see you, show you some exercises and get you going. Um, regardless, everyone is going to get up um, and walk as soon as they're able to. Um, we're going to you know, show you how to use the walker appropriately um, do stairs if you need to. And once you've met those goals and there's no medical concerns, um, your surgeon will be discharging you from the hospital. Um, so like Nicole said, it is a short stay. Um, please be prepared for discharge the day after your surgery, okay? In terms of outpatient physio, so at the end of the care plan there, um, please, you know, it, it'll depend when you're viewing this video. Um, the, the options may vary. Um, so please just reference the surgical page on the Joseph Brandt website. Um, we'll just have a document there with the most up-to-date information so you can be prepared for your, um, what outpatient physiotherapy will look like. Also in the description box of this video, um, we'll have a direct link to that as well. That information is gonna change as time goes on. So just reference that, please. 
So some things you can do on your own. So if we don't get to you on the day of your surgery, things that we want you to start doing as soon as you wake up, um, deep breathing exercises, lots of movements of your ankles. You can be bending your knees and, and moving your legs in bed. You don't need to be afraid of that after the surgery. Everything's all in place. So um, that movement of the ankles, especially though, is important. We don't want you um, to develop blood clots or anything like that. So right off the bat, get going with the deep breathing and ankle pumps. Um, we do try to give you a little bit of a warning before we get you up, especially if it's the next morning, um, just so you can be prepared and have pain medication on board so that you can uh, do your best. Um, those exercises I spoke about, we're gonna go through them. You'll be have the opportunity to have um, a whole like set of them done with a physiotherapy assistant while you're in hospital. But after you've learned them, then it's your responsibility to continue with those three times a day or working towards that as a goal three times a day. Um, and you'll do that at home as well. So weight bearing. So your weight bearing status is determined by your surgeon. Um, you're either gonna be weight bearing as tolerated or partial weight bearing. We'll go through more, you know, the specifics on that. The main thing to think about is if your surgeon does um, make you partial weight bearing, that means that you have to continue to use the walker until your doctor says, or your surgeon says that you are weight bearing as tolerated or full weight bearing. The individuals who are weight bearing as tolerated, you can work with your physiotherapist in the community um, to progress your walking. And um, you guys can decide together if you're ready for um, using a cane or an, another assistive device. So things to think about. So preparing for home, don't need any scatter mats getting in your way of um, using the walker and things like that. So just roll those up for, for the time being. Um, those dressing aids that Nicole told you about, good to practice. So you're familiar with them. Um, and then, yeah, just making sure you have clear pathways to the places you're gonna need to go most frequently. Um, if you've never used a walker in the home before, making sure that you know your pathway from your bedroom to the bathroom is clear for you to use with the walker. Other thing to think about is ice. So especially with the knees, but the hips as well, just thinking about um, a method of ice. Some of you may have been recommended to get an ice machine, but any type of ice is fine. Um, ice packs, um, whatever, you, whatever you choose, but thinking about having those prepared and ready for you. And if you have them, you can bring them to hospital. We can put your label on them and put them in the freezer. And if you have an ice machine, go ahead and bring that as well. Another note about ice though, if you do get an ice machine, uh, there's many models out there. Your, your nurse that day might have never seen the model of ice machine that you bring in. It's really important that you know how to use it so you can instruct them. They will of course help you and get you ice for it, but uh, they might not be familiar with how to set it up. So that will be your responsibility. If you are having difficulty with stairs right now um, and aren't, aren't managing well, they will probably be a bit harder when you go home. So maybe consider staying on one level. But those of you who are going up and down the stairs and aren't really thinking twice about it, you should be able to do the stairs no problem after the surgery. And like I said, we'll practice them here before you go. So think ahead about supports. So you're not gonna be wanting to spend lots of time standing, preparing meals and doing things like that in the days after surgery. So planning ahead for something easy if uh, you're on your own or making sure someone's there to be able to assist you or get you um, your meals for the first few days and groceries as well. Um, if you are home alone, maybe think about staying with someone or have someone stay with you. If that's not available to you, thinking about respite in a retirement home. Um, just know that, you know, if you're choosing to go that route, everything needs to be arranged ahead of time. Everybody's treated as if they're just going home. So if that's going to be your temporary home, then everything needs to be arranged before you, you get here. Just a note about home care. Um, with an, a surgery like this, where you know about it ahead of time, um, it's considered an elective surgery. Home care does not come to you to help with bathing or dressing or house cleaning, okay? Um, like I said, there may be involvement with home care in terms of physiotherapy um, only. And then, like I said, please just reference for most up-to-date information on the surgical page of the website, um, but it will be on an individual basis um, and it's all arranged ahead, like, sorry, not arranged ahead of time, arranged while you're here in terms of what that would look like for physiotherapy. 
So typically, if you were in person, I would be measuring you all for your walker. So here we've just done up a little slide. Um, so you might want to just go back and reference this. There's a lot of writing on it, but um, it does give you know pretty straightforward instructions on how you can determine how high your walker should be. So whether that's a measurement that you're going to take um, just to like fall in for your uh, walker rental, um, or you know if you have one and you want to check if it's adjusted to the right height, it's the measurement of your wrist crease. So the the crease in your wrist to the ground. So you can see in the picture there, there's a red arrow. And if you just continued that arrow along, it would but like bisect the uh, handle of the walker there. So that's where you want it to be. And that's gonna let you have a little bit of a bend in the elbows um, while you're holding the handles and that's what it should be. Okay, so you can read over the instructions there and that's the same measurement for your walker and your cane. Um, equipment, I'm referencing um, a page, a surgical page on the website that might be where you found the link to this video, um, but there's also lots of other information on there. Um, there is a, a document that will have some sort of identification of like a vendor list, um, but you are responsible for getting this equipment um, for having after the surgery. So the vendor list is non-inclusive, like it doesn't have everything, but it does have some options, but you're looking for like a home health store, like Wellwise, uh, Rexall, in Burlington, we have a few other independent ones like Brandt Arts. Um, you can go anywhere you'd like, but you need to have the specific equipment, which will be a two-wheeled walker for everyone. If you have a hip replacement, you need a commode or a raised toilet seat that Nicole talked about. Um, you may find that beneficial to have with a knee replacement as well, but it's required for the hips. And if you have stairs, you also need a cane. I will address a few frequently asked questions because I usually get this hands up at this point now. I'm asking if you, I most frequently asked question is, can I use a rollator walker or a four wheeled walker? The simple answer is no. The reason we use a two wheeled walker is because after this surgery, you need to put weight through your arms to take weight off of your leg. If you have four wheels, that's not really possible. And that's not what those kind of walkers are for. So, you know, our recommendation is the two wheeled walker. Another question I may get, can I have a walker with no wheels? Yes, that's perfectly fine, but you just won't be able to, you know, produce a gait pattern that's nice and like flows, okay? So with this, with no wheels, you have to pick it up with each step, but it's perfectly safe and fine if that's what you have. If you're just going to rent one or order one or buy one, get the two wheeled. Um, another question I get sometimes is crutches. Crutches might be appropriate. I would have to wait and see you in person to try them and, and give my recommendation. So what I like to say is if you're set on using crutches or you've used crutches in the past and you already have them, we can talk about it, but have in your back of your mind um, that you might need to get a walker if I tell you, or if you, if you um, choose to go with the walker based on trying one in the hospital. So those are some of the frequently asked questions. Um, I think that's kind of pretty much every time we do the presentation, we get that question, but uh, maybe another one might be um, re around rehab or um, continued therapy after. And I think Nicole really summarized it in her part of the presentation. That's not what happens. Um, you, you know, go home as soon as you've met the initial goals of being um, independent with your transfers or at your functional baseline, uh, being able to do things how you were before the surgery at least, and then um, with, with the walker, of course, but um, you know, the rest of your rehab or your physiotherapy happens in the community. So that's the end for uh, my presentation, um, and we'll see you when you come in for surgery.